at um, the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce uh, forum down there, and it was it was a fun and exciting morning, and uh, so it's good to be back here in the Woodlands with you. What I want to do is I want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about my motivation politically, and I want to talk about a little bit as well about the 83rd legislation legislative session and where we go from here. I grew up in New York, as many of you know, and in 19... Vicky, <laughs> fellow Yankee. We got smart and we came here. We got smart as refugees and came here. In 1965, my dad had a laundry dry cleaning business at the corner of Clinton and Monroe in downtown Rochester. And in 1965, what do you think the five most successful states in the union were? Come on. California. California is one of them. New York's one of them. Illinois is one of them. Michigan. Michigan was already in their downward slot, uh, slide at that time. Ohio is, is the other one. Um, here's the funny thing is that even in 1965, those states were the economic engine of the United States. They had, relative, they had balanced budgets. In fact, many of them had budget surpluses and low taxes. But the fix for their demise was already in. Because their budgets, if you start, if you go back and look at a graph, go to Google the, Google their state budgets. If you look, their budgets were already starting to grow at an exponential rate, and it was fueled by entitlement spending. Fifty-eight percent of the babies born in the state of Texas last year were Medicaid babies. Does that sound sustainable to anybody here? No. We grew the budget twenty-six percent this past year. Stephen Moore wrote an article. Um, in, in the Wall Street Journal, and he basically, in the article, said that Texas needs to apologize for Cal to California for the, for the spending increases this, this past year. I think the title of the article was, Cal that's pretty fun, huh? You're running down FM yeah. 1488 with your Lexus, and look, you've just sandblasted all the paint off the car. Um, that's what text I was saying they're going to have to do. Did they get any money? Do they have any money yet? No, we're not going to the ballot until when? November of this year to vote on whether or not to give them $2 billion out of the rainy day fund. Did we need to take money out of the rainy day fund to satisfy their need when we had $8.8 .8 billion surplus plus we increased spending 15%? The total increase by any 83rd over 82nd biennium was a staggering 26%. And so I hearken back to what happened in 1965. And everyone talks about the Texas miracle. And folks, it is a miracle. What's going on in Texas and the blessing and the, and the, the standard of living that we enjoy here is just, it's equal by none. Nowhere in the United States, nor in the world. You drive down Gosling and you see all these cranes and you see all this, all these mobility issues that we have because so many people are moving here. And I mean, this is just an incredible place. And we're killing the goose that laid the golden egg because of what we're doing right now with entitlement spending and the fact that we can't seem to control the Democrats who run the House and the Senate. Let me tell you what's going on there. And I've shared this with some of you before. There are 150 House members, 31 senators, correct? Two-thirds of the House, 95 members, just under two-thirds of the House is controlled by the Republicans. One-third, just over one-third, is controlled by the Democrats, 55 seats. 95 to 55. But the way it breaks out is you've got 30 very liberal Republicans, very liberal Republicans, that join 55 Democrats, and you only need 76 votes to get anything done in the House. Those 85 people control the Texas legislature. Joe Strauss controls the 30 Republicans, and Sylvester Turner controls the 55 Democrats. You would think that with a two-thirds majority, we could have our way. You would think with a two-thirds majority that basically two-thirds of the legislation that comes through the House would be Republican legislation, wouldn't you think? Guess what percentage of the legislation that came through the House was Republican legislation? It was one-third. <laughs> Two-thirds of the legislation that went through the House was Democrat legislation. And 
Um, it was something of a surprise in the 83rd legislative session when so many conservatives got elected to the House and so many of Joe Strauss's lieutenants were sent home packing. Um, it was, it was something, some, something of a shock to establishment leadership. And it was something of a, a shock this year when so many more got sent packing as well. Bennett Ratliff, for one. Mm -hmm. um, Bennett Ratliff thought that he could do anything he wanted because he was Joe Strauss's buddy and that he wouldn't have to answer to the voters back home. Matt Rinaldi got elected this past year and sent home a very loyal Strauss supporter. And, and on and on and on. About, you're going to see about 10 new fresh faces in the Texas House this year that are going to just create more problems for Joe Strauss. And folks, that's a good thing. When I got elected May 29th, I was coming home from Trattoria. We had just enjoyed a really fun night together and we found out that we won. And I was driving home and I got a phone call from the San Antonio newspaper. And they said, they said, uh, you must be really excited. And I said, I, I am. I'm excited for all the folks that worked so hard, knocked on so many doors. Um, this is really a cool thing. And uh, the guy said, um, are, you gonna end, are you gonna work towards ending the gridlock in Austin? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not aware of that. What gridlock are you talking about? And, and, and they wanted to say, well, the gridlock, the gridlock that exists between Republicans and Democrats. And I said, let me explain something to you. There is no gridlock. There's no gridlock in Washington, and there is no gridlock here in Austin. To grow the budget the way the budget has been growing over the past 20 years, people have to work together. Since 1990, you're going to love this, since 1990, the budget has grown 314%, while the population adjusted for inflation has only grown at 134%. Does that sound like gridlock to you guys? Yet during that same period of time, we did not take care of water. We did not take care of long-term plan for mobility either. We've got oil refineries this past summer that were within five days, five days of running out of water. You need five gallons of water to refine one gallon of gas. And the lifeblood not just of Texas, but the United States. Think about this a second. 40% of the jobs that are created in the United States today come from Texas. A big part of that is the oil and gas industry, thanks to fracking. Um, it, it, is, it has led to an energy resurgence in the United States that's birthed right here in Texas. And we have House leadership and senators as well, and in the Senate as well, that are not willing to address the fundamental issues and the needs of our state. Who does that? The House Republicans, conservatives, tried to address the issue and we hit it head on in every piece of legislation that we could. We met as a group, 18 of us, every Monday night. We held each other accountable. We, we encouraged one another. We strategized with one, or one another, we made sure that we voted as a block, and we got a lot done. One of the ways that they try and, the moderates try and discourage and uh, um, cast dispersion on the more conservative members of the House is they say, well, you know, they went there and they didn't get anything done. How many times have they said that about Ted Cruz? I mean, if Ted Cruz had a dollar for every time someone said, Ted, you're not effective, he wouldn't be mailing fundraiser requests to me every day. He's been incredibly effective at drawing a line in the sand and, and educating the people of Texas about what needs to be done to turn Washington around. And these 18 conservative Republicans did the same thing in the House. And it guaranteed that a bunch of them were going to have challengers. And two of the most notable ones are Matt Schaefer and Jonathan Sticklin and, and Charles Perry three of the most notable ones. And the speaker poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into those three races to beat those guys. And he lost all three of them. The conservatives won. Because when you come back and you tell the story that we were extremely effective, I passed 18 pieces of legislation out of the House this year, which is more legislation than my main challenger over, over two sessions, twice as much legislation over two sessions. I was extremely effective because one of the things that I was careful to do is that when Amy drafted the legislation through the Legislative Budget Board, 
We also had the Legislative Budget Board draft it as an amendment. An amendment has the same full force of law as a bill. So we had plenty of pieces of legislation that the Speaker killed in committee or killed in calendars. One of the ways that you kill legislation, there are two ways to kill it. You can kill it in committee, where you never allow it to be voted out of committee, or you allow it to be voted out of committee so late that it never makes it through calendars. Calendars is a graveyard for legislation, good conservative legislation. It is chaired by one of the most liberal members of the House, and it is staffed by the most liberal members of the House, both Democrat and Republican. In fact, it's half Democrat, half Republican. And yet, two-thirds of the legislation that comes through calendars is Democrat legislation. <laughs> but even still, I had 18 pieces that came through, and one of the nice things about an amendment process is that if you have the bill as an amendment, it bypasses calendars. It doesn't have to go through calendars. And so we would stick it onto a piece of a, a bill that that we knew that we could add the thing to where it was truly germane, and we passed it that way. It was an extremely first session for me, um, and I passed a lot of legislation, but I'll tell you something that I'm really excited about. <clears throat> Not so much the legislation that I passed as the legislation that I was effective at killing. SB 303, how many of you have heard of it? This is the, this is the end of life directive. You're familiar with it, Paul, you're familiar with it as well. My grandmother, uh, when I was 20, had a stroke. She went into a nursing home, or she went into the hospital, and then the hospital took her and put her into um, an, an, a nursing facility. It, it was really, truly hospice care. She was dying. And um, she had a paralyzed throat. She could not speak. And my grandfather could not wait. She'd had a stroke 20 years earlier, and he took care of her. He carried her and put her on the bat on the on the toilet every morning. He carried her to her chair every every afternoon. He fed her breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Bathed her at night, and he could not wait to get her home to continue to take care of her. It wasn't a burden. He was passionately in love with her. That's dignity. It doesn't matter what takes you. It doesn't matter how you pass. Dignity of life is how you look at your life and those that love you and how they care for you. And yet, to the Texas Hospital Association, and I hope that they're listening to this as Luke is um, taping this, to hell with you. And everything that you've done and all the money that you've poured into races to try and... and, and <sighs> they have poured more money into these races as of late than you can shake a stick at. And one of their bills was SB 303. They poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into races to try and get this bill through. And what it basically enabled them to do was to end treatment. It, 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 they, they could change an end-of-life directive without the family knowing about it or without, without the patient knowing about it. They could have basically said, if she has, if she, if she has a, um, a heart attack, don't revive her, without letting her know about it or letting, or letting my parents know about it. But it's even more insidious than that. If they're not able to move you from the hospital to a hospice facility within 45 days, which beds don't always just open up just like this, they're able to withhold water and food. They can starve you to death. They can withhold basic water, basic care, nutrition. And they kept pointing back to, well, they, and they would bring, they would bring uh, Texas Hospital Association, Texas Medical Association doctors in, what they would say, well, long-term care where someone is being fed intravenously, it can cause this problem, that problem. And I said, well, what about Karen Ann Quinlan? Does anyone remember Karen Ann Quinlan? Yes. Yeah. When was that, 1978, 1977? She lived 13 years in a coma before God said, now's your time to come home. Now I'm saying you're done. They took her off a ventilator and she lived an additional 13 years. They didn't starve her to death. They didn't deprive her of, of, of water, which is one of the most brutal ways to die. This is the kind of legislation that went through the House this year that made it out of, out of committee. But thankfully, we were able to, it actually did not make it out of committee. It made it through the Senate and we killed it in the House in committee. There are two of us that worked desperately hard at making sure that that bill did not come out of committee. 
Um, we had another couple pieces of legislation that I'm thankful that we were able to kill as well. Did you know, how many of you have more than one email account? How many of you check that second email account every day? How many of you check it? Do you have, does anyone have a third email account that they don't check just regularly? Do you know that when you put trash out at the street, do you know that that is not your trash anymore and that the government can go through that if they want to? Um, the government treats an email that has not been opened in 30 days like trash, and they should be able to go through it. Well, Texas Association of Business wanted to codify that in the law for the state of Texas and make it easier for employers to actually go into your, as a, as a condition of employment, that they have the right to go into your personal email accounts. They have the right to go into your social media accounts, your Twitter and Facebook accounts, and your private messages. And we said, are you kidding me? Anyone ever hear of the Fourth Amendment here? The Fourth Amendment doesn't keep, or I should say current law doesn't keep track with, um, with new technology. And we said, no, this is ridiculous. It was Helen Giddings' bill, and Helen's actually, she's a Democrat, and when she tried to put the bill through, she tried to stop this from happening, right? And what happened is the Texas Association of Business came along and tried to change the bill. It was an SB, it was a Senate bill, and it came through the House, and we amended it. I amended it on the House floor with Tim Kleinschmidt and fought for it at the back mic and we were able to change the bill to stop all of that so that they couldn't do it. Tab was so angry with me that they killed the bill and wouldn't let it out of committee and so thankfully the bill never 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 became law. But that's the kind of insidious stuff that came through our Texas House. Um, one of the bills, pieces of legislation that we were not able to kill do you know how dangerous the wrong color throw pillow can be in your house? You laugh. The Texas House decided this year that interior designers need to be regulated and licensed. Oh, wow. Folks, all this is, it's one group that when they finally get big enough, they get enough money and they form an association. They take that money and they give it to a lobbyist. The lobbyist then spreads the love around Austin. Money. And they put a piece of legislation in place and they say, well, you know, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we can't have interior designers that are designing against the ADA. Well, you know what? That's what, your, that's what your architect does. Your interior designer does not do that. That's what your architect does. It's a specious, foolish argument. But sure enough, that bill made it through the House and it is law now. What happens is these people that are in the business already, they're grandfathered in. They're already in, they're now licensed. And it makes it difficult for people coming along to start up and to get into the business. <coughs> I was able to kill the, the, the bill that, that as well for, the, um, it was myself and one other person, they were able to kill this bill from the back mic. And it was a, it was a bill that wanted to control um, individuals that, that, that um, do foundation repairs. And again, it's the same type of stuff. They just want to create barriers to make it difficult for other people to get into business and to get a start in life and to make things more difficult. This was an extremely effective year. Um, we didn't get everything that we wanted, but we didn't end. When the session ended in August, with three special sessions, we didn't end. We just went to work. Myself, Stickland, Schaefer, Goldman, we went to work all over Texas recruiting candidates to run for the House, helping them find the money, helping them find good consultants, and then helping them put on effective campaigns. Jonathan Stickland is an example. He just won his campaign. Schaefer just won his campaign. They have not let their campaign crew go. They're coming down into the woodlands in a couple weeks. They're going to be walking for me at different times. We're working hard to make sure that we stem the tide in Texas. Here's the key thing. We had anywhere between 33 and 53 votes that went our way. And you say, not good enough, you need 76. True, you do. But we picked up 10 seats this year. So now it's going to go from 33 and 53 to 43 and 63. The magic number when you're at 63 
if you're a Republican and two-thirds of your party is voting conservative and you're that other third and you're choosing to vote with the Democrats instead of your own party, then you're going to have some explaining to do when you go back home. This could be the tipping point when we get from when we go from 3343 to um, 4363. We're going to continue to work hard. Um, it, it took a long time for Texas leadership in the House to get into the condition that it's in right now. And frankly, it's going to take the people of Texas to re-engage. And that's what happened in 2010 as a result of the Tea Party. We went from a 76-74 majority where Texans were on autopilot and they're just continuing to elect the good old boys year after year after year. To 2010, this thing called the Tea Party got involved. And we went from a 76-74 majority to a 102-48 majority as a result of the Tea Party. I am so thankful and so grateful for all of you that have helped me and for all the assistance that you've given me, all the encouragement and prayers that you've given me. I'm going to continue to fight for you in the Senate. There's so much more that we can do in the Senate. With the advent of Wendy Davis leaving and Connie Burton coming in and picking up two seats, plus me picking up Senator Williams' seat, and Dan Patrick relaxing the 21 rule back to 19, we can draw a line in the sand. The Senate can draw a line in the sand and force a showdown with the House. And I'm, I'm convinced Dan Patrick is going to do it. I know I'm going to do it. I've had great discussions with Connie Burton and the other conservatives that are coming in, including Van Taylor. And we're going to make this work. We're going to turn things around in Texas, right-size this budget, make sure that we take care of the core responsibilities of government and only those core responsibilities of government. We're going to leave the rest to the private sector. I hope you'll continue to help me. I appreciate you guys so much. God bless you.